Can you feel the wind at your back? According to research from Shai Davide and Thomas Gilovich, probably not nearly as much as you can feel it in your face. In one classroom exercise, Davide asked students to Google images for headwinds and tailwinds. For headwinds, there was a whole host of images of people being blown backwards and destroyed umbrellas. For tailwinds, not so much, other than the occasional aeronautics diagram of planes. Images of headwinds are more available to us, not just online, but in our minds. In their paper, Headwinds and Tailwinds, they examined the psychological phenomenon that shows we have a tendency to remember the obstacles we faced more than the help we received. Over coffee a few years ago, Davide told me one story that helped explain why. Imagine Usain Bolt sets a world record for the 100 meters, not a stretch since he's already done so numerous times. If I told you he did it in spite of running into a strong headwind, you'd be all the more impressed by his accomplishment. If I instead told you that he did it because of a strong wind at his back, it might cheapen his feet in your mind. None of us want to diminish our accomplishments or the roles we've played in our success. We didn't ask for the tailwinds. They were just there. Usain still had to train and sprint and beat the competition. We still have to get up every morning and put effort into our work often struggling to get by or to get ahead. On one hand, the presence of tailwinds shouldn't diminish our effort or accomplishments. On the other hand, to not acknowledge them is to take for granted the extra push we may have received along the way. As you walk around today, notice the way the wind blows, for you or those around you, both literally and more importantly, figuratively. I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people from all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel a little more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today, I'm talking with Shai Davide, assistant professor at Columbia Business School. Shai's research examines people's everyday judgments of themselves, other people, and society as a whole. In our conversation, we'll cover a lot of ground from his fascinating and prolific research studies on how we think about what contributes to our success and failures. But make sure you stay on to the end of our talk, where we'll chat about how this plays out in our own lives and the tough choices we make for our children. Have a listen. I hope you enjoy. So, Shai, it's interesting. So, I've been talking to you over the years about your work, but one of the things I've never really gotten any sense of is your own sort of personal story. So can you just talk a little bit about how you even got into this work, how you became interested in psychology and questions around mobility and how we get to where we are in life? I think like many academics, especially in the social sciences, I did not want to become a social scientist. I had a dream of becoming a writer and I thought, well, you know, I have to study something. So I'll study psychology so I can be a better novelist. And you know, then life happens and you realize that, you know, you don't want to set yourself up for a life full of obstacles. So, you know, so I, I didn't end up becoming a writer. I ended up marrying a writer. I remember taking a few courses in, in psychology and academia and, you know, during my undergrad and thinking, this is interesting. You know, I, this is telling me something about myself and about how other people around me are. And then I kind of tabled that. I went to work Outside of school, you know, I worked in some online advertising company, which was great. It was a small startup, two guys that owned it and started it. And I was their first employee and I enjoyed the work, but there was something missing. And I just remember feeling like it can't just be about a paycheck. There has to be some additional value. And that's when I started thinking about maybe I'll go back to school and go back to, you know, studying things and creating some value. And And that's how I ended up in graduate school. I had no idea what graduate school is. I, no one in my family has ever gotten a PhD. No one's an academic. I remember not even knowing how difficult it is to get in. So, and I tell this today to students as a story about how, if I knew how difficult it was to get in, I may not have applied, but I was clueless. I'm also from Israel and, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to apply. I, you're the top schools in the country, in the U.S., I'll apply. So I sent my application to Harvard and and Princeton and Yale and Cornell, not knowing that, you know, one or two people out of a hundred get in. And then I ended up getting admitted to a couple of them and which was very lucky and incredible. And if I'd known that my chances are one in a hundred, I would 
probably not have wasted my time. But I didn't know. I was clueless. And then I went to, I got my PhD at Cornell and I fell in love with the program there for two reasons. One was the incredible people that were around me, the other students. And the second was my incredible advisor, who's still teaching at Cornell, Tom Gilovich. And the way we would work is just look at the world, say, hey, what's interesting? And then figure out, okay, can we study this? Can we understand these interesting things in the world? And I remember one day we were listening to a talk by a researcher from Harvard Business School, Michael Norton, and he was showing this work, which is now has been really publicized. and A lot of people know about it. When you ask people to estimate the level of inequality in the U.S., they tend to really underestimate it. You know, they don't realize just how much of the wealth is owned by the top 20 and the top 40% of the U.S. And they don't realize how little is owned by the people in the bottom. And I remember being just like shocked by his findings and his graphs and saying like, there's something more here. And I remember talking with Tom and saying, you know, this is great. People are underestimating inequality. This is a great finding and we need people to know about this. But I think people don't care about inequality. And we just started talking about it and we realized what people care about is not how much the rich have or versus the poor, but whether the poor have a chance to become rich. And then we started thinking about all these questions about upward mobility and social mobility and how do people perceive their chances and how do people perceive the world and realizing that that's such a big part of the way people approach life. And it shows up in so many different aspects. And ever since, you know, that's been a big thing of what I've been studying. In that sort of origin story, there's so much there to unpack. There's the serendipity of just sort of taking a couple of psychology courses and then being like, wow, this seems sort of interesting and sort of tucking that away. It reminded me when I was my senior year of college, undergrad, I stumbled into this class on urban planning. And I was like, wait, this is a job? I mean, it was so cool and interesting to sort of see how cities are designed. But I had, I was ignorant, you know, that that was an option, right? And so the fact that you get introduced to something, you know, then the sort of ignorance is bliss idea of, you know, just saying, you know, I'll just try this, you know, which is great. And then you land at a place where you're surrounded by people who are then formative for the rest of your career. And it's a space where there's a premium on sort of just thinking and asking questions and figuring out you know, where to go, which it would seem to me that in a lot of fields, that's probably a luxury. Right. And, you know, and and if I really have to think about it, it even starts before I ever went to undergrad. So first of all, you know, when I went to school, I came from a family that both had the means to support me, at least help me with my rent when I was going to school. So I could focus on, hey, this course looks interesting. Maybe I'll look into it rather than think about what's practical. But they also not just had the means, but they also were willing to do so, right? So there was like, I was already in a position that many people who might have been interested and benefited and maybe even more successful than I was didn't have, weren't in that position. And I think the other thing is, you know, I came from, A school background, you know, going to middle school and high school in Israel that was completely public schools was there was a value on, hey, what do you think? Rather than, you know, hey, tell me what you memorized. Right. And and the same thing at home. It was always like, hey, what what do you think about this? And there's arguments and disagreements, but there, there was a value on thinking and expressing yourself. I usually don't stop to think about that as being something that has formed me. But obviously, we all know in the back of our heads that those early life experiences are incredibly formative. And I see it now with my own son. So I was going to ask you on the cultural front, you know, your experience in Israel and the public schools, you know, and thinking about sort of talking to you today, I just went back and I realized, wait, so you're from Israel. Daniel Kahneman and Amos Dversky, you know, are also Israeli sort of behavioral economists and psychologists. Dan Ariely, same thing. And I was wondering, is there something in the water or is there something about the culture that is more inquisitive, you know, that allows that kind of influence on the field? You know, part of it has been chalked to the argumentative nature the culture in Israel, that everyone has an opinion, sometimes more than one. And that's something that's valued. But again, if I'm being honest with myself, I went into a field where there's all these luminaries that are Israelis. So even though nobody has ever met me, you know, before, being an Israeli is almost like a tiny ticket in, 
right? So people have that comparison. Oh, you know, you went to the Hebrew University. That's where uh, Kahneman and Tversky started, didn't they? You know, so there was already like this tiny leg up. And when I, and I, I see it with myself, you know, a lot of times people in minority group, they tend to take care of each other. And not that Israelis are disadvantaged in any way. I don't think so, at least not in the past 20 years. You know, if I try to help other Israelis that are yeah. applying to graduate school, just giving them like, hey, I'll, you know, I'll go over your materials, kind of giving other people back what I received for being Israeli. In a weird way, it creates this unique structures where, oh, there's a lot of Israelis in this world. There's a lot of Israelis in this field. But yeah, it's funny, right? It's, they're all, we seem to be all over social sciences. So uh, I want to go back to your uh, light bulb moment, I guess, after listening to the Norton talk and how that now has sort of led to a series of studies that you've done, often in partnership with others, and sort of do like a quick sort of <laughs> A speed round of your research. So try to imagine sort of condensing your life work in a couple of minutes. But <laughs> let's start first with where you left off, which is this notion of people's perceptions around inequality and how that sort of impacts their perceptions of mobility. Because it seems like, you know, you've uncovered some interesting relationships there that on one hand may seem intuitive, but I don't think a lot of people connect. No one's happy when they see a high level of inequality. Right. When we see someone on the street, you know, begging for money and someone else in a you know, very expensive Rolls Royce, that doesn't make us happy. Right. But a lot of people are willing to accept it. They're willing to accept this high inequality because they make attributions about why that person is in the Rolls Royce and why that person is on the street. Right. And that attribution, those attributions that they make, they stem from this idea that all people start with an, an equal chance of succeeding and they start this race. And then some people are faster. Some people are more motivated. Some people are quicker on their feet, whatever it is. And those people get rewarded with the Rolls Royces. And the people that didn't work hard enough or didn't have the abilities are the people that are on the street, right? That's what goes on in a lot of people's mind, especially when they're confronted with inequality. And that what makes them willing to accept the inequality. Again, they're not happy about it. Nobody, maybe I'm an optimist, but nobody wants to see people on the street, but they're willing to accept people on the streets, you know, begging for money because they have in their mind this idea that everyone has a chance of mobility and then some people grasp onto that chance and succeed. Is some of that a manifestation of what I guess is referred to as like a just world sort of philosophy, where in order to sort of wrap your head around someone being homeless, you have to justify it somehow to yourself. Like the world is fair. So the only explanation for that outcome is something that that person has done. Right. So a lot of it has to do with people's need to justify the systems, right? If we live under a very unjust system and we have no way of changing it, our only way to make do with that system is to say, well, you know, it's justified. The, the procedure was fair. The outcomes may be biased, but the procedure were, was fair. But other parts of it is because at least in the Western world, that's something that's been drilled into us from childhood. You know, it's the stories we hear, the movies we see, it's in a lot of the Judeo-Christian religions. This idea that the just are rewarded and they get to reap the rewards and then their kids get to reap the rewards. You know, so the idea is that we all have a chance. And I was really fascinated by this because in a way we don't all have a chance. I mean, we all have the possibility, but we don't all have the probabilities. And I think that's a very big distinction. You know, any one person can become a Bill Gates, but the probabilities, the chances, you know, someone who starts off life on the street are much lower than someone who starts off in a family that's, you know, much wealthier and more, and they get more chances of education and so forth. So, you know, so I started studying this. And one thing that I realized is that people's misperceptions of inequality, what I first saw in Mike Norton's talk back in 2011, I think, and their perceptions of mobility are actually linked together. 
the reason why we think that everyone has such a high chance of succeeding is because we don't realize that people start off in a very different situation in life, right? And I kind of like to think about it as, you know, the reason why we think everyone can win this race is because, because we don't understand or we don't realize how much this is not a, a typical race, it's a relay race, right? And some of us are handed the baton much earlier than others. And because some of us are handed the baton much earlier, those people have a much higher chance of succeeding. So we, because we don't understand how much inequality there is in society, we tend to think that there's a lot of mobility. You know, it's interesting. This is a topic that is ripe with metaphor, right? And so there's, you know, bootstrap, there's, you know, climbing the ladder, you know, winning the race. You know, I've heard recently someone sort of describe it as in an ideal world, it's an escalator, which seems to sort of subtract individual agency, which is probably not a helpful metaphor. But I've never heard the idea of a relay race, which gets to sort of the intergenerational component, right? Which I think people largely don't appreciate, you know, previous generations set up the next and some systems are such that certain populations are just disadvantaged from, you know, being able to benefit from that passing down of different benefits. You know, to me, the metaphor of the relay race, which is something that I've been thinking about a lot in the past couple of years, is the most complex one because it really catches the difficulties that we all have in thinking about inequality and mobility. Because when you think about a relay race and you think about the first people to run, you know, and, and the first person to kind of pass the baton, they all started off at the same time, the same, you know, gunshot. So that person deserves to pass the baton earlier, right? So you can think about that as like the first person in a family to make wealth. In a way, they should be allowed to pass some of that wealth to, you know, for children, but not just the wealth, but also the opportunities. They should be able to pass on the social connections to their children, the connections to their alma mater or whatever. But then when you look at the person receiving the baton, now we get the more complex situation where they may be faster. And that's why they are also, you know, they receive the baton and now they're going to pass it on faster. But part of their success is, is just by receiving it earlier, right? So I think of that as the child of a very wealthy person, you know, starts off life in a much more privileged manner, you know, p- privileged position in terms of money, but also, again, in terms of schooling, in terms of health-wise, in terms of dietary abilities. But they may also be incredibly intelligent. We don't want to take that away from them. They might be very highly motivated. We don't want to take that away from them. And yet we need to reconcile that with the fact that they started off life in a privileged position. And I think that's where people have a very hard time accepting that and thinking about that. And that's where we see a lot of divides where, you know, typically on the left side of the political economic world, people say, it's all situational privilege. And people on the economic right side, they would say it's all personal agency and ability, right? And the truth is, it's somewhere in that middle. We don't know where exactly in the middle, but it's a very complex thing to talk about. It's a very complex thing to show in narratives, right? So yeah. you and I have talked a lot about movies and, and books and how do you portray the idea of privilege? And I think that's a very complicated thing. But I think the more complicated thing is how do you portray the idea of agency plus privilege working together? Yeah, I think I mentioned a while ago is we recut the training video from Rocky. So, you know, when people think of Rocky, they think of like, no one's ever worked harder than that guy, right? You know, to overcome all the odds to become sort of the, you know, champion of the world and, you know, amass wealth and all these sorts of things. But a closer viewing of that, you'll see all these advantages that he has from people who have helped him along the way. Now, not as we were discussing sort of the intergenerational passing of wealth, but the fact that, you know, his loan shark boss loans him some money or he catches a break earlier on because the boxer that Creed was supposed to fight gets hurt or that he has a trainer who's there for him, Mick, in spite of everything, that he is able to get free steaks from Polly every day, you know, when he goes to the meatpacking thing. These kinds of little things that we don't always sort of notice. And it brings me to another sort of area of research, which I've borrowed gratuitously from you, which is the, again, another metaphor of headwinds and tailwinds and what we're able to recognize in our own lives and those of others. To me, I think that's a really compelling way to look at it because 
you know, versus the relay race, which sometimes can feel very linear, you know, headwinds and tailwinds sort of, it's able to sort of capture a lot of things that could be happening at different times, but collectively tell an interesting story about, you know, what allowed you to get to where you are. I'm just curious, one, how you even stumbled upon sort of that metaphor, and also maybe just define a little bit, you know, what we mean by someone's headwinds or tailwinds in their lives. Yeah. So I'll just start off with giving full credit where credit is due. The origin of the metaphor of the headwinds and tailwinds before we kind of sharpened it was all due to Tom Gilovich. And I think he was probably cycling one day in upstate New York and realizing how hard it was cycling against the wind and saying, ah, this is horrible. And probably when he turned around, he didn't give the wind in his back any second thought, even though it was helping him. So that's credit where credit is due. But, you know, the idea of the tailwinds and headwinds metaphor is that every one of us, no matter how easy and privileged or difficult and underprivileged our lives are, we all have forces that help us, that push us forward, these tailwinds that help us succeed in life. And then we also all have these forces that work against us, these headwinds that make it difficult for us to achieve what we want to achieve. And the idea that what we found is that when people think about their lives, they are much more likely to notice the headwinds, these obstacles that they have to face and overcome rather than the tailwinds, the things that help them succeed. And the reason we use this metaphor Again, it's because when you are jogging or cycling and you're cycling against the wind, it just feels hard. You can't not notice it. It's in your face. It's really like holding you back. But the moment you turn around and it's at your back, even though it's the same force and it's now helping you, you notice it at first, you may feel a bit lighter, and then you completely forget about it. And you forget, hey, there's this force that's helping me. And when you use that metaphor, you can really analyze many situations in life, both in terms of personal histories, but also in terms of, you know, collective histories of groups and and of countries, which I think is really interesting. And that's why a lot of people kind of relate to this metaphor. What's fascinating to me is, you know, we use that terminology and the metaphor when we were constructing your American Dream Score, right, which asks people a series of questions that we know contribute to mobility. And, you know, based on their answers, we're able to give a loose approximation of how many things they had working for them um, versus how many things they had working against them. So tailwinds and headwinds. And to me, what's interesting about that is that you're right. People's initial sort of thoughts are that they remember one more than the other. But when prompted and when they're given the opportunity to reflect, it can be really revelatory. And I remember seeing so many comments by people who were like, I never realized I had this many things going for me. You know, so so we find that it's much easier to notice your headwinds than your tailwinds. But that's not to say that you cannot notice your tailwinds. It's just that we don't really stop to think about them. But then there are moments in life when we do, right? People, when they get awards, you know, like think about the Oscars. Right? Like, what do people talk about? They talk about... Thank you this and thank you that, right? Uh, When people retire, that's a moment of reflection. So we have these culturally sanctified moments where people do reflect on their tailwinds. So for me, I'm an avid reader. And one of the best things that I love doing when I read a book is reading the acknowledgement section, right? And I love thinking about the novelist sitting there and thinking about what are all the things that helped bring this book to life. And usually all those things are people. Right. They, a lot of times it's, you know, thank you, my editor. Thank you, my parents and my spouse and whoever it is. But notice that I assume that for a novelist, there's four years of lamenting their headwinds and how difficult their writing is and the publishing world is and so forth. And it is not to say that it is and I'm not minimizing. But then only at the end, we allow ourselves to take a moment and think about, OK, what helped me here? I think creating more ways where people are able to accept their tailwinds and think about their tailwinds is important because it can lead to gratitude, it can reduce resentment, but it can also allow you to see what privileges you have had that other people may not have had and how do you make sure that they get those. You're spot on there because when I had written my first book, I remember my favorite part of the experience was writing the dedication and the acknowledgement. 
and how grateful that made me feel. You know, at the same time, as I dove deeper into this kind of work, I realized that and now going back and even reading those acknowledgments, how superficial isn't the right word, but they weren't that deep, right? You know, I wasn't sort of stopping to think about if it weren't for Claiborne Pell and in the, you know, invention of the Pell Grants, I wouldn't have been in college and I wouldn't have been in a position to write a book, right? Or some of the other people who are often more invisible to us, maybe because they're behind a program that we benefited from or made a certain place more receptive and helpful to us, an environment. and. I'm just wondering what you think about sort of the depth of the way in which we reflect about some of these things. So yes, there's cultural moments where they force us to sort of stop. But what's also interesting to me is, you know, for every 10, you know, thank you speeches at the Oscars, you know, two feel really genuine and eight feel like it was a listing of like their team and their agents and things like that. I'm always amazed when you see an acceptance speech like uh I don't know if you saw Kevin Durant's MVP speech, but he took 45 minutes to thank like, you know, teammates who lifted him up one day when he was down or someone brought him a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And it's a tour de force of tailwinds. And it's really exceptional. But it seems like we're not, even during those times when we can reflect, we're not that disposed to think really deeply and have those moments like, oh yeah, if it weren't for that person. I think part of that is because a lot of the tailwinds that push us in life are not that visible. We really have to either notice them or have someone point them out to us. A few years ago, I actually went ahead and and analyzed Oscar acceptance speeches. Now, if you look at Oscar acceptance speeches and the people accepting the Oscars, they are overwhelmingly white male Americans, right? And practically nobody goes up on the podium and says, I want to think, you know, the genetic pool, you know, having been born white at first, because that would kind of shed light on systemic problem that people feel uncomfortable talking about. But then because a lot of people just don't realize this, they don't notice this. And what really I remember, and I forget the name, and I there's a British director who won the Oscars, I want to say at 2014 or 13, but I may be wrong at the year and I can get you the name, where he started off by saying, I thank you, the United States of America, for accepting me here. Realizing that, you know, he could have been an incredible filmmaker in England, but his career would have been not as successful just right. because, you know, he he was in this situation. So I think an outsider is more able to notice the tailwinds than an insider. And this is what we find in our research. When we look at other people, we're very likely to see, oh, this is, these are the forces that are helping them, but not when we look at ourselves. And I think we do this deeper processing that you talk about. The problem is we do it when we think of other people, but not when we do it at ourselves. So we have the ability. It's just much more difficult when we think about our own lives. I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station WNET in New York, reporting on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity in America. You can learn more at pbs.org backslash chasing the dream. And now back to our conversation. I'm sure you've seen this in your own work. I certainly have. Like, this is a really charged area. And it's very difficult sometimes to have these topics because, like you said, if you think about this sort of politically, you come at it like it's, you know, the system's broken and it's a lot of environmental factors and that's what sort of is the problem. And if you're on the right, it's more, you know, well, people just need to work harder. And to try to bridge that divide and have conversations is a real balancing act. You know, I think back to some of the political speeches in the past where like you didn't build this and i hear that you know i know that elizabeth warren when she was saying that were what she was trying to say but i sort of cringed because i just knew that there'd be a vast percentage of the country that would just chafe at the idea of individual initiative being challenged right and so there is this sort of challenge personally of how you get people to reflect right and realize things without trying to diminish their own sense of agency And I think what you're also sort of going to is this notion of this balance of how we see ourselves versus how we see others. And when we turn and we look at other people and how they've become successful, I know you've you've done some research on, you know, the notion of deservingness, you know, and specifically people who have achieved wealth and how we 
put certain sort of assumptions in terms of whether they deserve to achieve that wealth versus they didn't. And I'm wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about, you know, how we judge others and this notion of deservingness, which I don't think gets a lot of attention these days in terms of just being able to own our own sort of thought process when we sort of come to these judgments of others. So when you think about deservingness, the idea of deservingness, what it really boils down to is, did you earn this? Is this something that you worked for or could be credited for? Or is this something that is due to some external forces? And those external forces can be sheer luck, but there can also be some systematic biases or quirks in the system. It's almost never the case that it's just one or the other. You know, if you look at every successful person in the world, from the most admirable individuals like Bill Gates to maybe more vilified wealthy individuals, which I obviously won't name, if you look at every one of them, there has been a lot of personal agency. They worked hard. They were very intelligent. They had the skills, the know-how. And then there's just admittedly a lot of things that worked for them. I like to think about Bill Gates because right now, a very admirable person, he's made all this wealth, but then he's also giving a lot of this wealth back to society. And what we found in our research, this was done with Juliana Black uh, from the New School, that when wealthy people give away their money, they signal something about their moral character. And we take that signal and interpret it as they deserve to be wealthy. They worked hard for their money. Now, when you think about Bill Gates, undoubtedly he's a very you know, incredibly intelligent guy with a lot of charisma and a lot of vision in the early 80s and 90s for what personal computers could be. But you also you know, have to ask yourself, would he have been as successful as he is if he didn't live in one of the few counties that had, you know, access to personal computers in the late 70s, early 80s? Or would he have been as successful if he was born in a country that didn't have so lax tax laws? And you realize when you kind of pull everything together that if he didn't have all these things working for him, he wouldn't have been the Bill Gates that we know. But also that if he wasn't as intelligent and driven as he is, he wouldn't be the Bill Gates that we know. And like you said, the problem is If you start pointing out, you know, you didn't build the roads, the infrastructure for the internet that made you incredibly wealthy. If you say that, people can hear you as if you're saying you don't deserve this, right? And that's the problem because what you're trying to say is, hey, you deserve it and the system deserves part of it as well because you and the system worked together. Of course, you know, I cannot fight the fact that I am a white heterosexual male. Right. And a part of my success so far in academia has been due to these three factors. I don't know if that is a small part or a huge part. If someone comes up and say, hey, let's point out the fact that Chai is a white heterosexual male, they are right to point it out. And they're right to point out that there is a lot of bias in the system. But they run the risk of Chai hearing them and saying, oh, are they saying that I'm not smart enough? I was curious if, because I know this anecdotally, where people will look at someone who is poor and they'll judge, they'll make a judgment on how they spend their money. Like, well, how do they have a phone or what do they do this? And I wonder if you have any thoughts or if you've explored that question about sort of the darker side of us making judgments about others to justify, you know, their station in life and and lack of success. There is a lot of work on the stereotypes that we hold about the poor. And a lot of these stereotypes tend to revolve around laziness or incompetence. And again, these stereotypes, in a way, what we're doing is we're saying, look, this person deserves to be poor because they didn't work hard enough, because they weren't smart enough. And the problem there is that just like when we think about wealthy people and we say they worked hard, so they deserve to be a millionaire or a billionaire, and we kind of fail to see all the things that held them up, When we say the same thing about someone who is poor, they are poor because they didn't work hard or whatever, what we're doing is we're failing to see the things that have held them back or held them down. And I think that is even more complicated, especially in the U.S., because income levels tend to be 
correlated with other factors like racial factors, which bring in racial stereotypes as well. And, you know, just like with any stereotype, they're not only wrong, they're doubly wrong because attributing them to any specific person in a group makes them very wrong. And I think that's part of what the U.S. is reckoning with right now, is how to talk about these interconnected inequalities in a way that is beneficial rather than dumbs down the conversation. And again, I think part of the reason is when we say income levels, you know, partly tinged with racial inequalities, there's a danger. And I think that's something that's very important, that someone who is white and poor would feel like, hey, what about me? Right. And light in conversation would be a conversation that says, I'm not taking that away from you. You have had so many headwinds against you. You may not have been born in one of the you know, hubs for mobility in the U.S. Um, you, haven't, you may have not been born in a place where schooling is great, right? I'm not saying that you haven't had this headwinds. What I am saying is someone who's white, non-white and was born in the same situation as you have had additional headwinds. That's not taking your headwinds away. And again, that's such a complex conversation to have. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because it is really complex and it's very easy to look at, you know, single factors in having these kinds of conversations and not really look at the fullness of any one person's lived experience, right? Because, yeah, you can be black and not grow up in a poor neighborhood. So you had, or obviously you can sort of have, you know, parents who were both college educated and those are benefits to you, right? And conversely, you know, you could be, you know, white and poor and had no one in your family go to college. And so in those two examples, each of them has something working for them and has something working against them. And it's impossible to quantify how much one factor is holding someone back versus one factor that is pushing someone forward. But, you know, the fear I have that in, is in today's society, we really don't create the space to have those conversations. Like even as I'm giving that example to you, I'm like in my head self-editing and wondering like, can I keep this in the interview or am I going to say something that people will take offense to, right? And I think that's a real tough spot for us to find ourselves in if we want to, you know, advance solutions we know can help people of any race, background or experience and make sure they have the opportunities they need. I think you're right. And I think, you know, the fact that you and I and many other people are now thinking will this offend anyone is actually a good thing, not a bad thing, right? A lot of people are talking about, oh, we can't have these conversations because someone will be offended. And I think, you know, 10 years ago, people would had conversations that are very unhelpful, not even thinking about the fact that someone could get offended, right? So I think the fact that we're thinking about these issues is progress, maybe not enough progress. But what I think is important is when we bring to the surface all the inequalities, all the difficulties, And these can be racial difficulties and differences. These can be geographical ones, which are very huge in the U.S. These can be about mental and physical abilities. You know, when we bring to this could be, you know, sexual orientation and everything. And if we just bring them to the surface, we'll realize that there are many solutions that might not solve everything, but they can benefit a lot of them. I saw something you've done recently on exemplars, right? This notion of you know, what is the role of seeing someone around you? And I don't know if it's only people you know or just sort of have access to their stories. And how does that make you feel? Like, so if you see someone doing really well, is that something that inspires you or something that is actually sort of has an adverse effect? And I think about that in the context of how many rags to riches stories that we sort of tell and we hold them up as like something that should be intuitively inspiring. And perhaps in many cases they are. But I wonder what the aggregate effect of culture that tells those stories almost exclusively, right? So I'm I'm wondering if you just sort of share a little bit about what that research is and also your thoughts about how, you know, again, when we think about that in the context of, you know, the American dream and rags to riches, how that may be playing out on our collective psyche. The basis of that work is that we all evaluate ourselves at some level vis-a-vis other people. And these other people can be people we know, but it can also be people that we've heard of, we saw on social media, or just these ideal images we have in our minds. And what 
this work that you're alluding to shows, and this is work with Tom Gilovich and Sebastian Derry at Cornell, is that when we think about ourselves, you know, am I smart? Am I funny? Am I good looking? We can't help but think about other people that are really, really smart or funny or good looking. And we end up comparing ourselves to them and thinking, oh, wait, I'm, I'm lacking in this regard. Even if I'm really, really handsome, which I'm not saying I am, but even if I'm really, really handsome, you know, it's easy for me to think about very good looking others and then feel a little bit down about myself. When it comes to understanding ourselves in terms of, am I doing well financially? What should be my living standards? We do the same thing. We think about, okay, so who else do I know around me that's doing well financially? We immediately bring to mind some people that are doing really, really well. We might know them personally. We might have kind of heard gossip about them. We might have seen them on TV. And we can't help but feeling like, oh, wait, I'm actually not doing that well. So in a way, like you say, these stories might inspire us, right? If I see someone who's really successful, I might be more motivated to succeed myself. I might be able to learn a few things from them, seeing like, how did they become more successful people? But at the same time, I can't help but internalize that comparison and think, oh, wait, why am I not there yet? Right? So it's this double-edged sword that is even more sharpened by, again, what we talk about in the media. When you look in the media, like what are the things we celebrate? We celebrate very good looking, young, rich people. And most of us are lacking in all of those regards. And then we can't help but compare ourselves to those people in reality TV shows and our newspapers. And we end up feeling like we're somehow lacking. And at the same time, we put those people on a pedestal. Are there other questions out there that you think are uniquely suited to our time and this question that you are, that you're just eager to explore? So two things that come to mind, one that I've been exploring quite a bit, and I've I've been trying to take broader perspective on these questions and trying to understand how people think about not just their chances of success, but their chances, how their chances are influenced by other people's chances. So I've been drawing a lot from zero-sum thinking, which is this idea that when one person succeeds, someone else fails. And trying to understand why people view life like that. Because if we do see other people as succeeding at our expense, or other groups succeeding at our group's expense, we end up feeling resentful towards other people. We end up acting in hostile and aggressive manner to other people, and we end up might even hurting our own chances of success. So I've been studying a lot about these questions of when people see society as zero sum. But some another question that has been really interesting to me is something that I've noticed a lot in the US context, but also somewhat in Israel, this reluctance to talk about money, right? When you think about, you know, the last time you've had a conversation about money, like dollars and cents, and you try to think about who it was with. Like we rarely talk with our friends, even our closest friends about money. And the problem there is that all these things that we've been talking about, this inequality and our chances of mobility, they all boil down to us being able to know how much we have and how much other people have. But if we don't surface those things, if we don't talk about these topics, then we can live our lives as if if these inequalities don't exist, which might help us move throughout life feeling that the world is just, but it obscures the potential solutions for all these problems we've been floating. So I'm hoping in the next few years to think more and study the psychology of this reluctance to talk about money. And I wonder beyond sort of money, just the idea of benefits or what some people would call sort of privilege. I was actually having a conversation last night, you know, with some friends and it was this notion of like, as parents in the United States right now are trying to sort of make decisions around schools and what they do, you know, some people, you know, saying I'm going to do a pod or pull my kid out of school or, you know, get a tutor or, you know, go to a private school. And this is already in a town where the public school system is, is really great. Right. And so it's a question of how much is enough? How much do you sort of push, you know, your chips into the center to help your kids, for example? 
And to some degrees, we all make decisions where we move to a better neighborhood where this, because of schools or, for example, and we acknowledge that like we had that benefit to move and other people didn't, right? One of the things that's really interesting that I see in some of Raj's work where people's sense is that, well, if his research shows that some zip codes do better in providing upward mobility, why doesn't everyone just move to those zip codes? And it's not as easy as that, right? And there's also the acknowledgement that when you move, you are pulling yourself out of something. And by doing so, do you make the something you just left? less than, right? And so it was interesting, you know, getting to your question of zero thumb, one of the people I was talking with last night's like, I don't see how doing well for my kid, you know, would hurt someone else, right? And I was like, well, you know, I see where you're coming from. And I also acknowledge every parent's desire to do as good, you know, as, as much for their kid as they want. But the reality is their kid will compete in the same world as that other child, right? And so there is this notion that none of us lives in a vacuum, but we live in a society where we'll interact with each other. You know, there is, you know, a finite amount of resources, whether those resources are jobs or, or money or what have you. And it's interesting, I, I'm wondering in your own personal life, how some of these conversations may play out. Like if you're, you're saying like, you know, doing research about sort of talking about money, and I'm just wondering, you know, I find, you know, having these conversations with friends to be really important and helpful if not really challenging. And I have friends and family members who are on both sides of the political aisle, right? And, you know, to me, we're in a time where these conversations need to happen, and yet they're really difficult. So I'm wondering, you know, how that plays out in your own life. I think that's a very, very difficult thing to navigate. And I think I make more mistakes than correct directions when I navigate that course. But I think the most important thing is acknowledging that where people are coming from in that regard. I think because you give you bring the example of your children. And I think that's the most difficult and sensitive thing to think about that, you know, I, my wife and I joke, oh, we used to be very liberal before we had children. And now we're still very liberal, but we used to be even more liberal because all of a sudden you're having children really tests you on almost an everyday grounds on how much are you devoted to this idea of correcting inequality. And it, it could be big things, like you said, you know, which schools to send them, but also small things. Like every time I sit down with my four-year-old son to work on reading and writing, you know, I realize that not everyone has that privilege. And when I'm in that situation, when I think, oh, I'm creating an inequality now because my son will be privileged going into school. And he will be at the, you know, hopefully above average, which is going to create these, in, these inequalities. I realize that there are two ways that thinking can go. The way that we don't want this to go is the destructive way. What I mean by that is, okay, I don't want to create this inequality, so I won't give my son my, these privileges. And I think that no one benefits from that. I think the second way, the constructive path for this could go is I realize that I'm giving my son these privileges. But as I'm realizing this now, I want to try and see how I can give other people these privileges as well. Right. And I think that's where helpful conversations come from. We are in a situation now, my son, not next year, but the year after will be going to kindergarten in New York City, the most unequal uh, school system in the country. And we are in that place where where do we send him to school? Do we send him to a private school? Do we send him to a public school? And, you know, we're leaning toward public school because of our ideals, but we haven't made the decision. But what we do know is that even if you send your child to a private school, what you should be doing is working to make public schools better. Because public schools that are better will not only help other children, but in the long run will help you not face that decision, right? You can create a world that's better for everyone else. And in that way, you're actually creating its world, but it would be also better for you. And I think that's the important thing, like trying to understand how do we make this into a constructive thing? So this has been a, a fascinating conversation. I just want to end what I'm trying to do in the, at the end of these episodes is, you know, you typically have sort of the credits that sort of you talk about at the end, but I, I want to give people who I'm talking with an opportunity to, to do their own credits. You know, so I would like you to sort of take a minute. You can be as exhaustive as you want or as limited as you feel you'd like to be. And just take a minute to thank some of the folks who have helped you get to where you are. Oh, man, that's an incredible thing to do. I'm I know. I know. It's not, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry. It is interesting because when I did this with someone else, they said, well, no one's going to know 
who these people are. And I said, yeah, but that's the point, right? Everyone gets a free pass in terms of leaving anyone out because they are being put on the spot. And it's better to acknowledge some people than to acknowledge no one, right? Yeah. So instead of naming people, you know, and I will, you know, obviously the first names that come to mind are my parents, my wife, and my grad school advisor, which have been immensely, you know, supportive throughout my life in different ways. But I think I would say a general thank you to anyone who's helped me without knowing that they're even helping, that they're even doing this. I'll give you one story, one anecdote. And that's when I was in the 11th grade, I was a really good student, but there was just two things that I really hated about school. And one of them was in Israel, you had to learn compulsory Bible studies, which I just didn't do well. And the other one is that I had to learn literature, uh, what in the US is called English. And I just sucked at it because I had my own view of what writing is like. And I was just bored in every class and I got horrible grades. And there was one teacher who was just like so empathetic. And she, without knowing that she was doing something great, she would just hang out with me and say like, hey, you know, like, let's talk about the writing that you enjoy. Let's share some writing. I want to read what you are reading. Uh, That's not going to help you with school, but that's not the goal here. And I think without even knowing that she did that, and her name, I should say, is Megi Yahalom, which I haven't seen her in like probably 20 years. But without even knowing what she was doing, she was actually giving me hope in a situation that for me felt even in a very minor, you know, lowercase hopeless. And I think there's been so many people like that in my life. And I hope that I've been able to be like that for other people. Just like, hey, you know, let's talk. Let me introduce you to this topic. Let me introduce you to this person. Not with an understanding that this is going to be a big game changer for you, but actually thinking this is just a fun social interaction. But those things, when they add up, they actually create this incredible thing. But this is what we are. I wonder if it's if you ever thought about the fact that there are probably by now with all of the research you've done thousands of people who have participated in your research names of which you have no idea but of you know but without them you know a lot of this work wouldn't have happened right Yeah you're absolutely right Bob I actually want to thank you for bringing that to my attention because that's something that I haven't considered and You're right. We tend to put scientists on like, oh, they discovered this. But scientists only discover what, you know, their participants are willing to disclose. And sometimes we're doing it out of just pure need for money or desire for money. Other times we're doing it because they have a real desire to participate in this endeavor. So yeah, all the MTurkers, the college students that have been participants in our research, all the other samples that we use. I mean, it's incredible that we live in a world that we can do that. I can run a study from my own, you know, laptop somewhere in the world. And then people from all over the world can respond. That's incredible. Well, hey, I wanted to also take a moment to uh, thank you. Your research has been so seminal and foundational to all the work that I'm doing. And it's not a leap at all to say that, like, that none of it, including this podcast, would be possible if it weren't for the work of you and others who have been studying this issue for years in ways that have so informed so much of what you know I'm trying to do with the, the work we're doing at the Moving Up Media Lab. So thank you so much. Thank you. That means a lot. And I really look forward to you know hearing all these episodes. I think we're going to you're creating something interesting and I want to be part of it. Thank you for listening to Attribution. This show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. To learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter, please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener, and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. If this show has reminded you of someone special, make their day and let them know.